I just finished wiping the tears off my eyes because I finished watching episode 5 of The Book of Boba Fett. These are the kind of words that you never think you would say in a video, but I really, really did. Not only for the nostalgia, which this episode is completely filled with, with the best kind of nostalgia, but also the heart and the moments, the little tidbits. Nothing is wasted in this episode. There are fragments in here that show exactly what a Star Wars universe should really be about. Not a moment felt hokey, not a moment felt fake, and we're gonna talk about the entire episode starting right now because I'm about to cry again. I don't want to do that, guys, so leave a thumbs up down below and uh, comment on what did you think about this. This episode made me realize how much I love The Mandalorian, and it's no joke. Like, Boba Fett is all good and fine, but I can't wait for the season three of The Mandalorian. Let's just leave it at that. So funnily enough, we've never seen a me factory in Star Wars, and this marks the first time. A shadowy figure, what looks like a bounty hunter, comes around the plastic drapes, and quickly we realize that it is actually Din Djarin, making his first appearance in the Book of Boba Fett. As he's passing through these butchers who are cutting up the meat, we realize once again that Din Djarin is on a bounty. It rings very similar to how actually the Mandalorian started in Episode 1 where the series starts with him going on a bounty. The fun really begins when he finds his bounty, Cobb buys. The guy sitting there actually denies it, but there is no denying to the Mandalorian, who quickly starts fighting his goons until one of them has a blaster, he actually pulls out the Darksaber. Now you'd think that Din Djarin would be this cool ass Jedi that he would wield this saber as proficiently, but immediately we find out that he is having trouble wielding the dark saber. And this is the genius of what these guys do with the details. The details always matter. What Star Wars has basically done with lightsabers and such is convince us that it is the easiest thing to wield a lightsaber, a dark saber, any weapon of this kind. Well, Din Djarin actually showed us that it isn't so. He was proficient with the Beskar staff. He was proficient with a lot of weaponry, but the Darksaber he just can't seem to handle. It is heavy, in his words, and so much so that he even cuts himself in the process while wielding it, showing that he is still an amateur in saber wielding. As always, the adage, practice makes perfect. Obi-Wan, Anakin have just spoiled us, it is confirmed. With the head of the bounty in tow, Din Djarin comes out in a room full of butchers waiting for him, but he informs him that in this room there is a pile of New Republic credits. This is the way he gets his freedom. We get introduced to a very interesting world, can I say? It's the Elysium Spiral, basically. It's the Elysium City, in a, in a sense. It was inspired, I guess, by that. I see it as a mishmash of Coruscant and Nar Shadda. It is very intriguing, very interesting. The elevator ride was something to chuckle at. But in the end, as promised, the bounty is delivered. We see that Din Djarin is asking for information, the Mandalorian Sanctuary. Later we find out that this information is the location of Luke Skywalker, presumably, who took Grogu to be trained as a Padawan. Later we find out that Din Djarin is adamant in seeing Grogu again. He misses the hell out of the little guy, and I can admit that we miss him too. This episode especially felt Grogu's absence, so much so that I really think they're gonna handle the Grogu situation in the Book of Boba Fett rather than in The Mandalorian Season 3, because his absence does leave a gap, a hole. So it is entirely possible that by Episode 1, Grogu will somehow be in the fold again. I don't know how, but I'm guessing we'll see that the Mandalorian Sanctuary, where the infamous armorer is residing. The female Mandalorian that we saw in Season 1 of The Mandalorian. Limping and hurting, Mando does arrive at the Mandalorian Sanctuary, meets with the armorer, but can barely walk in the process. This is when Paz Vizsla may get an appearance as well, helps up Mando, and basically treats his wound. Now we get an up-close look at the Dark Saber, especially the hilt, which Din Djarin says that it is made out of a special kind of Beskar that he has never seen before. It is at this point Din Djarin realizes the truth behind the Darksaber, that it was constructed by Tar Vizsla a thousand years ago. 
More than the Darksaber, Mando has the Beskar Spear as well, which the armor immediately informs him that Beskar should not be used for weaponry, it should be used for defense only. Which kind of doesn't make sense, I mean we just talked about the Darksaber being, being made from Beskar and the Darksaber is basically a weapon, it could be used for defense but it could be used for, for offense as well. However, we get one of the greatest things to come out of the episode, a gift for Grogu made out of Beskar guys. And at first I really thought that the fanfiction was going to become true, Grogu was about to become a Mandalorian and in tiny Beskar armor, but in fact I think if we look closer it is a chain. I think it is this chain that we see, but made completely out of Beskar. I really love this part from the armor when she mentions that their descendants used to ride mythosaurs, however that has become legends now. Jon Favreau directly is talking about how Disney created its own canon and now things are left in legends. This is just genius, I love it. The bombardment of the Mandalorian was bone chilling to see actually and it reminded me a lot of the Terminator for some reason. I guess seeing all those droids comb through the streets for survivors and killing every single one of them just gave out that post-apocalyptic vibe. We got an up close look at Mandalorian training. It is gruesome, it is rough, but it is necessary, because Din Djarin simply cannot handle the Darksaber. He doesn't know the technique, he has never wielded this kind of weaponry before, at least it seems so, because the, his entire life he was accustomed to blasters and weapons that shoot at long range, nothing really in melee close combat. Seeing this weakness, it is Paz Vizsla who wants a shot at obtaining the Darksaber. Din Djarin accepts the duel, and while it looks like Paz Vizsla will get the upper hand, simply because Din Djarin is clumsy with the Darksaber, he is however proficient with a vibro knife, as he ultimately defeats Paz Vizsla. The problem though comes afterwards. The armorer asks Paz Vizsla has he ever removed his helmet, to which Paz Vizsla says no. When she asks Din Djarin however, he has no choice but to confess that indeed he has. It is because the armorer and Paz Vizsla believe that Din Djarin betrayed the creed that they ask him to leave and never come back. In fact, the armorer even tells Din Djarin that in her eyes he is no longer a Mandalorian. Even Bo-Katan does not have these strict rules. She said to Boba Fett that you're not a real Mandalorian, but she did not say so to Din Djarin. However, now we see the real beliefs of the armorer. She is of a very strict sect of the Mandalorian creed. With this, Mando has no choice but to leave and he leaves for Tatooine. We find out later that he was leaving because it was promised to him that a new Razor Crest was waiting for him. We get a cutesy scene of him removing all of his weaponry before he goes on a commercial flight. On the flight, he is constantly being reminded of Grogu. The Rodian kid didn't make it easier, of course. He was green too, so that was funny. But he comes to Mos Eisley, and immediately afterwards, I got the first jump scare in Star Wars. It truly scared me, this one. And it's the ones you least suspect, of course. It is the hangar of Pelimoto that we are watching. Din Djarin comes to her in a promise that that she, in fact, has found a replacement for the Razor Crest. What we find next, of course, will be the most glorious thing to ever come out of the Book of Boba Fett, and that is the N1 Nubian starship that Pelimoto has acquired in order to replace the Razor Crest. It's rusty, it's skimpy, it's not in tip-top shape at first, and Mando scoffs at it, but we see that with time and with great care and responsibility, this N1 Nubian starship, this I should say this modified N1 Nubian starship, becomes one of the greatest staples, I think, that will be in Star Wars. This ship will be remembered more than the Razor Crest. I might be wrong, but trust me, by the time we get to Mandalorian Season 3, you're gonna get to see the N1 Nubian starship in full action. I really think that Mando should not be a Han 
Solo with a big ship. He never really got to use it that much, that entire big ship. A fast moving starfighter would serve Mando real well. Even better, I think. Oh, and one more thing, we get to find out that Pelimote actually dated a Jawa, I didn't even know that was possible, and that Jawas are furry little creatures. She then mimics a rat, so it is entirely possible that Jawas could have rat features, I guess, but the best greatest part that actually got me to tear up guys a tear was rolling down my cheek in this one is when Din Djarin got to test drive the N1 Nubian starfighter the sounds alone were spectacular marvelous I loved every second of it but when he went around the canyons where the Bunta Eve pod race took place in episode one where Anakin Skywalker roamed through these canyons with his pod racer when we got to see these streets these canyon rifts for the first time since the Phantom Menace again. And keep in mind, we're seeing this 36 years after the Phantom Menace. So you see these updated houses? This has been a byproduct of 36 years. When I saw this, I really got to tearing up. It was an emotional roller coaster. It was pure nostalgia. And honestly, this episode really brought to the forefront that The Mandalorian is just a dominant show. And I really can't wait for season three, I gotta be honest. However, things are not the same way in space as Din Djarin finds out quickly. Because a pair of X-Wings from the New Republic Patrol stop Din Djarin on his tracks and ask for identification. We get a quick cameo of Carson Teva again, but before he could ask Man Mando some questions, he bolts quickly, not using his hyperspace drive, but because of course it's it's an N1 modified ship, we see that he used his sublight thrusters to get away. With just these small details, you understand how great the starfighter is for Mando. He doesn't even need hyperspace to get away from people, let alone the weaponry and such. Again, it's I think it's gonna be a great, great ship for Mando, at least for now. Once he comes back down, someone was waiting for Din Djarin, and that was, of course, Fennec Shand who, as we saw in the previous episode, she and Boba Fett came to an agreement that they need more help, and Fennec Shan knew exactly who to turn to. Din Djarin officially accepts the offer from Boba Fett, However, before he does that, he, he's got to pay a visit to a little friend. I went completely berserk after I heard this line. I didn't think Mando would do it so quickly, but he is going to visit Grogu right now. I don't believe it's going to be in the next episode of The Book of Boba Fett, because basically this is going to become the Mandalorian show again. But what Mando is referring to, I think, is season three. I think we will see him pay a visit to Grogu in the first episode of season three, and this was basically the setup for that. When, what will happen with Din Djarin in the Book of Boba Fett in future episodes? I really don't know. He committed to Boba Fett, however, he does want to see Grogu immediately because he just can't stand missing him so much and he wants to deliver the gift. So it's going to be interesting to see the next episode, are we going to see Din Djarin or not? But if you saw the episode, you know that Boba Fett does, did not even make it for a second in this episode. I really didn't believe that would happen. I didn't think they would have the courage to call the series The Book of Boba Fett and show an episode where he is not featured for a split second. It's very bold, and I hesitate to say kind of disrespectful. At the very least, Fennec Shan shouldn't have come to tell Din Djarin this. I think it should have come from Boba Fett himself. This is a way where you circumvent Boba Fett showing up in his own show for crying out loud and talking to Mando again, but... Hey, it's not my show. I don't know what they're planning, so we're going to leave it for the next episode to see what will happen. What did you guys think about this episode? Let all your thoughts be known down in the comments. Thank you guys so much for watching this video, and if you enjoyed, leave a thumbs up down below. Subscribe for dailies. Now you have an awesome day, Star Wars fans. I'll see you in the next video, and may the Force be with you. Until then.